Over 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. Yet, less than one half a percent of marine habitats are protected, compared with 11.5% of global land habitats. Our oceans and coasts are facing unprecedented pressure from threats such as climate change, marine debris, and habitat destruction. The challenges that are facing the ocean today in terms of pollution and extraction um, this idea that the, the ocean has always been this vast bounty of resources for us to take from and that whatever we did to the ocean didn't have an impact. I think that the trends and the scientific information that we're getting today is certainly showing that that's not true anymore. Every state is an ocean state. We are truly all connected. Our ocean is the lifeblood of our planet and we must ensure, we must take action to make sure that we're healthy. It's not for the planet's sake on its own, it's pretty selfish. It's about making sure that we are healthy and that we have an appropriately healthy place to live, not only for this current generation, but for future generations. By 2010, 80% of all people will live within 60 miles of the coast. 80% of all pollution in seas and oceans comes from land-based activities. In response to these threats, coastal and ocean managers are turning to Marine Protected Areas, or MPAs, as an important management tool for conserving coastal and ocean ecosystems while sustaining the varied human uses they support. MPAs are special places in the ocean where resources are protected by laws or regulations. As people study the ocean, especially scientists, we're finding that the ocean is changing in ways that cause concern. The ocean is changing dramatically as the world warms. The scientific community began to study marine protected areas as a tool for managing the oceans and that research through time became very compelling. MPAs are not a new concept. They exist in all regions within the United States, but are prevalent along the West Coast. In 1999, California passed the Marine Life Protection Act, becoming the first state in the U.S. to establish a comprehensive system of offshore protected areas. We previously had almost 20 different uh, types of MP, uh, marine protected areas and it was difficult to track. Resource managers themselves said this is confusing. We need to simplify. So we simplified it. We, we simplified it down to three different classifications. Reserve, park, and conservation area. A reserve essentially is an area where you cannot extract anything. Not just living marine resources, but also geological and cultural resources. A park is an area where you can't extract anything commercially, and there may be some restrictions on the take of or extraction of resources on a recreational basis. And then a conservation area is some combination of commercial and or recreational extractive limitations. Studies show that protecting critical marine habitats, such as warm and cold water coral reefs, seagrass beds, and mangroves can dramatically increase fish size and quantity. There are a number of benefits that marine protected areas offer to um, not only to the ocean environment, but to users of the ocean environment. Marine protected areas are a management tool. They're one of many. Uh, they, they aren't as some people might call them, the answer to all of our problems, 
Uh, but there are certainly times where marine protected areas are a tool that we should be utilizing. And in California, we certainly have. There are benefits to the ecosystem from marine protected areas in that you uh, protect large swaths of habitat as opposed to previously we managed individual species uh, rather than the habitats upon which they rely. Uh, and what we found is that that's not the most effective way. And so Marine Protected Areas Act in a very similar way to say state parks or national parks, refuges, reserves, etc., on land. And we've learned in the terrestrial environment that protecting those larger swaths of, of land is a more effective way because not only then are you protecting the habitat, but then a variety of species that rely upon that habitat. So we're applying that same concept to the ocean environment with marine protected areas. So there's a, a benefit to multiple species, multiple habitats. If they're designed correctly, a series of MPAs can function as a, as a network. So you have benefits not only in the specific MPAs, but you have benefits then across uh, and between MPAs as uh, different species are, either through their larvae or adult uh, movement, uh, can move from one MPA to the other. In 2009, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration began implementing a national system of MPAs. This system will bring together MPA programs at all levels of government to identify and address common conservation problems, especially those that require working beyond the borders of a single MPA state or region. There are 1,700 marine protected areas in the United States, and the value of the national system is that it increases the visibility of each and every one of those sites and adds strength by providing that partnership for those sites to work together. So first of all, they're getting the recognition within their local communities that they're contributing to a nationally important conservation goal. And it doesn't matter whether they're restoring seagrasses or helping combat invasive species or trying to protect corals down in Florida. Whatever they're doing, they're able to make those connections with other sites that have the same goal and it strengthens all of the sites together. The national system will be based on sound science and stakeholder involvement. There are a lot of people like fishermen and others who use the ocean who have concerns about marine protected areas. And to them I would say look where we were on the land compared to the ocean. It took some visionaries like Teddy Roosevelt to establish the first national parks and to recognize that we had treasures that needed to be protected. I think you can't overstate the importance of stakeholder engagement in MPA decisions. MPAs can be used to manage fisheries by prohibiting certain types of fishing gear to protect spawning aggregation sites and nursery areas that are particularly important for sustaining fisheries. Constructive public engagement in MPA planning is vital to achieving conservation goals, both in establishing sites and in ensuring their effective long-term stewardship. Marine protected areas have been um have red flagged fishermen and the minute you say marine protected area they think of a complete closure. If you want a marine protected area to actually be effective you have to have buy-in by the stakeholders. The stakeholders that are most affected by any marine protected area are the fishing industry uh, whether it's recreational or or commercial and in order to have that buy-in, you have to have the, their help in developing where those boundaries are. You have to have a public process that allows them to have their, their feelings known. I am passionate about the community of fishermen that I belong to. My family, my children, we have grown up as a fishing family and no fisherman in New England wants to be the, the person who catches the last fish. More than 3.5 billion people depend on the ocean for their primary source of food. In 20 years this number could double to 7 billion. 
Humans catch and consume nearly 29 million tons of fish each year. Marine protected areas are a proven tool for conserving our ocean resources. They ensure sustainable production of our ocean fisheries. And furthermore, they protect the long-term health and sustainability of our oceans. I grew up on the coast. I watched it change from what it used to be. And uh, I'd like to see it a better place again than it's been. If we don't do this right, and if we fail, as uh, uh, Dr. Jeremy Jackson uh, from the state of California once said, uh, we're going to end up with an ocean of uh, bacteria and jellyfish. Uh, and that's something nobody wants to see. Uh, so there's the best time to start is always now. You can point to what you should have done in the past, uh, and maybe there are things we could have done, but we didn't. Uh, so the question is, how do we make what we have now better?